The SEMA show is unlike anything else on Earth. It is the world's biggest car show, and it is completely crazy. If you're going to hold such a crazy event, I think it makes sense to hold it in a completely crazy place. And that place is Las Vegas. Let's be honest, is there anywhere more crazy? For me, my journey began at 3.30 in the morning when I was greeted to our first snowfall of the year. I jumped in trusty Sandy and I drove three and a half hours down to the nearest airport in the US. After missing a connecting flight and spending hours in the airport, I finally arrive in the land of palm trees, freeways and traffic. I go and pick up the Jeep and I'm really excited to check out the finished interior. No, wait a minute. You guys don't want to see that right now. I jump on the hectic freeway and after a 21 hour travel day, I finally arrive and hit the pillow. Early in the morning, I have time for an oil change on the Jeep and tidy up a few small jobs before I again hit the road on my way to Las Vegas. Good morning everyone. My world has changed once again and I'm looking at Las Vegas Boulevard and the Strip. Uh, it is Monday morning and I need to drop the Jeep off to get it into SEMA. So SEMA is the world's biggest car show. I believe it is the biggest show in the world. They've been building more and more buildings every year, like expanding the convention center, and it still isn't big enough. It overflows outside and into other buildings and other regions. So the show starts tomorrow morning at nine, but I have to get the Jeep in today at nine because there's so many vehicles, they have to put them all in and they all block each other in. The scale of this is ridiculous. And uh, so here I am, I'm driving through Vegas. So I'll give you guys a look. And Vegas is nutty at the best of times, but they're actually doing a ton of construction right now because the Formula One race is on in two weeks. And so the whole strip right now is under construction because part of the race is actually on Las Vegas Boulevard on the strip. And so there's pylons and barriers and overpasses and tons of temporary construction. Last night they were like building all kinds of enormous overpasses that's all temporary just for the race. It's utterly insane. Like I said, Vegas is insane at the best of times. Now I feel like it's gone next level insane. And actually I recognize that's West Hall right next to me, the main off-road hall. Well, that's where Sandy, the Africa Jeep was displayed last time, right in front of the building that's on my right. Uh, but apparently I'm loading in over here. I don't even know where I'm going right now. I hope I'm doing well. So there we go, I am all set. The Jeep is in its spot, we're in the diamond lot. We're just outside, I think it's the West Hall right in front of me. And uh, it's kind of crazy, the Jeep actually looks really tiny compared to what's here. There are just so many enormous vehicles with huge tires. But uh, there's the main building, the convention center, pan around a bit, the Jeep, all of the ridiculous buildings. Yeah, here it comes, SEMA, let's... Uh, well, today's only Monday, so tomorrow when the show opens, I will wander around and I'll show you guys a few things that I find interesting at SEMA. I wander into the main off-road hall and I'm immediately overwhelmed. There's so much stuff to look at and so many people. This Porsche catches my eye. I really like how they're displaying it covered in dust and they've got some cacti and trying to make it look like it's in the desert. This is classic SEMA where you bring a vehicle and then have a whole display to try and amp it up and make it look more fun. For the opposite reason, this really clean Jeep stands out to me. I've always loved the Jurassic Park tributes, and although this is a brand new JL Wrangler, it has square headlights, just like the original YJs did in Jurassic Park. So check this one out, this is fascinating. This is my buddy Tony, who actually was an engineer at Jeep for many years. He has built a composite camper box on the back of a JL Wrangler. Would you believe it? This is actually inspired by Michael's renderings that were on Instagram a long, long time ago. Tony saw Michael's renderings and said, I'm gonna build the same thing. So this is what he built. And it's fascinating to see what decisions he made that are like really similar to what Michael did what decisions he made that are a little different, and then what decisions are a lot different. 
Probably the biggest difference overall is that this is a 4 by e which means it has batteries and it has like a hybrid drive system as well as a gas motor. But what that means is the batteries actually live down here under what would normally be the rear seat. And so you can see this distance here is quite a bit higher than on the camper that Michael designed and built. So the whole box is physically sitting higher than the box on our campus. Looking at the detail really closely, the box is also a little bit further forward as well, maybe about, about nearly an inch up here at the top and maybe half an inch down at the bottom. And he did not build a B-pillar splash like we did. This is purely just silicon bridging the gap. He said it took him a long, long time to cut this so accurately that there was basically no gap. Um, and you can see he has finished his pop-up roof. So Tony made a pop-up. He used the fabric actually off a JL Wrangler soft top uh, because he has access to all of that. And then on the inside, it's actually got a functioning ice cream machine. It's a little ice cream bar. It's got a like good trim. It's actually really kind of cute and really fun. And Tony pointed out too, the list of flavors that are available, it's actually just all the sponsors that help sponsor the build. So it's really fun to see in the year that Michael decided to design and build a composite camper box on a Wrangler, so did one of the former Jeep engineers basically build exactly the same thing. You're good, man, no worries. So it's really fun to see the details too. Tony used tail lights off a Gladiator that he then shaved down to make them flat instead of cornered. He did pick up a wiring line in the harness to get a turn signal, which is something that I'm going to investigate. Um, and obviously it's got monster tires on it, monster Dana 60 axles. You know, it's, it's a monster truck, but it is also really similar to our camper box, which is really fun. I really enjoy seeing another one. And it's been really great to talk to Tony and get into all the details about how it's similar and how it's different to ours. Maybe my favorite vehicle at SEMA so far. Make no mistake about it, there are thousands and thousands of people and it is packed. Of course, I had to swing by the AEV booth and they've got the Sierra Grande concept here. And uh, so check out some of the details on this are just incredible. The way that they have made the brush guard, the front bumper hole integrated with the winch. They've got these brand new tires from BFG. These things are F load rated. 40 inch tires on an 18 inch rim. AEV told me they've been working with BFG for a long time on these. Those are actually really rad. And then of course at the back, we've got a flatbed or a tray bed, just like Australian spec, as I would always say. And I really like this thing. I think it's really impressive. There is one thing though, that I've never loved about these tray backs that I would change in a heartbeat. And that is that the tray is about a foot above the frame of the vehicle. It's really dark down in here. Hopefully you can see. This is the bottom of the tray way up here. Then we have a few inches of aluminum, then a huge big gap of four or five inches. Then the frame of the truck is all the way down here. So any weight that you put up there in the bed is automatically a foot higher than it needs to be. I don't really like that. Ideally, you would either fill that space with water tanks and diesel tanks or draw storage or what might be even better, but it compromises the usability a bit, is you lower the whole thing down and then you have to have the fenders cut into the bed. So instead of it being flat in here in the bed, you would actually have big fender humps here, kind of like we did in our camper. You could see how the fenders intruded onto the inside. I think personally that would be really nice because also it would lower the bed so it makes it easier to get things in and out. But most importantly, it just gets that weight lower that is really the only thing I would change. But of course it is a concept, it is just a fun like look at what's possible. There's no word on if it'll actually go into production if they'll ever make this, but it's definitely attracting some attention here at SEMA, there's no doubt about it. As well as that, AEV have a Prospector XL. They've been making these things for a long time now, they're really awesome. All the big goodies, you know, on a big uh, Ram 2500 platform. And then of course they have a Wrangler as well. And uh, some of these suspension bits, identical to mine. Same front bumper, the snorkel, the rear bumper. This is AEV's whole package. I love too, they've updated their tire carrier and their fuel caddy. These are the same ones that I had in Africa. You know, 50,000 miles on the worst roads in the world. Mine still works flawlessly like the day I bought it. So 
cool to see the AEV booth because they always bring real vehicles that are proven and tested and actually work. They're not bringing just bling that is stupid and had to be brought in here on a truck and doesn't even drive or, you know, the drive shafts aren't even connected. That just goes against who AEV are. So always fun to have a look around here. You always see cool things and cool people hanging out in the booth. Right now I can see like three celebrities in my periphery. Kind of fun. While I was in Central Hall, I wandered over to have a look at Tavarish's P1. It's pretty funny to think that this car was entirely flooded with seawater and that he's rebuilt it to this level. Also, it was really great to be able to see inside of a hyper car like this, not something you get to do every day. The craziest part about SEMA is that it's all things for all people automotive. So as you're walking around, you'll see a ginormous lifted pickup truck sitting right next to a Nissan Skyline or a Toyota Supra, then some other hyper car like a McLaren, all the way back to a monster pickup truck. And then maybe there's some gems sprinkled in there, like a really nice old Land Rover Defender or a muscle car like this Mustang. They're all around. To appreciate SEMA, I think you have to appreciate the amount of effort and the attention to detail that has gone into these vehicles. While I have no intention of ever owning one, and I personally think they look a bit gross, I think it's really interesting to see someone or some group of people have poured energy into building these. There is absolutely no detail that was too small. The amount of effort here, powder coating all of the bits of the suspension, installing portal axles, monster tires, dealing with the suspension, the articulation. It's really impressive to see what people come up with and the lengths that they go to to make an attention grabbing car. Speaking of attention grabbing, this thing is called the Half 11 because it's kind of half of a 911. And I actually went to dinner with one of the brothers who designed it. There are big things coming from these guys. It's gonna be amazing to follow. There we go. I knew there was a cool Defender tucked in here somewhere. These kind of gems are just sprinkled throughout the show and you have to kind of look for them. It's almost like an effort to go and find the things that appeal to you. And of course, I like the four wheel drives in the off-road, but there's plenty of people wandering around who are super excited about the Nissan GTRs and the Toyota Supras. So it's just fun that it is all things for all people who love automotive. Growing up in Australia, these Nissan Skylines were pretty common, although they're exceptionally rare in the US. And here is a beautiful example of a Mercedes G-Wagon. This thing is on portals and massive tires. I don't actually know if some of the carbon fiber pieces are real, but it's certainly looked the part. The fastest way to get around the convention center is to hop in the Tesla tunnel. So this is Elon's pet project, digging tunnels under Vegas and using Teslas to taxi people around, completely free and kind of fun too. So I'm out here in the Overland Experience area and there are obviously some cool vehicles out here that I need to show you guys. And uh, the first one here is right next to my Jeep. This is from Supertramp Campers. So these guys have been building really awesome slide-on campers and that's one there. They've got on a massive Boeing Customs tray back, but you don't have to do that. You could put it on kind of a regular pickup truck. I think it goes on like an F-150 or, or something of that size. And that they're making, I think Kelsey said they're making eight or 10 of those a month. They're doing really well, it's really high quality. Had a good look inside at how they did their canvas, the zips, the doors, the windows, all of that because that's coming up on our build and I need to learn as much as I can. But anyway, this is what they've just created. They're calling this thing Megatron for obvious reasons. This is a fiberglass custom camper that is utterly incredible. I talked to Kelsey and Keith at length about how they made the mold for this, how they're doing all the production and fabrication in Colorado at their facility. And I hope that I can actually go there and get a tour at some point, they invited me. So next time I'm passing through Colorado, I'm gonna go and check out Supertramp campers. They just got this thing done in time for SEMA. So the inside is empty right now. It's a little bit like mine was a couple of months ago, but overall that thing, I think super impressive. And it's gonna be really interesting to see the price point and the weight 
and you know if it's going to compete with something like earth roma or something of that size and that scale let's see what they can pull off another thing out here in the overland area that is utterly bonkers this i think is classic sema there is an eight by eight jeep so i'm going to assume that it was a gladiator i don't know that for sure but let's assume it was a gladiator they have stretched it immensely so to start with it actually has six doors so I had a good look earlier and I can see up in here where they welded it and where they joined it. But so that's the first thing of interest is that it is enormously long, just like as framed like that. But then <laughs> there are actually three axles back here. And the really fascinating part is that all three axles have steering knuckles and all three axles have drive shafts. So actually, all the axles steer and all the axles drive and you can see this is all ginormous stuff it's on airbags it's kind of raw steel right now i imagine they didn't have time to paint it before they got it here this thing is utterly ginormous i'm gonna say does it win the award for the biggest jeep surprise it's not inside it's such an attention grabber this is what SEMA is all about though build the most outrageous thing that you possibly can to get as much attention as possible I think they might be winning. Something else I'm looking here that's really good is this massive van. And I'm not really interested in the van so much as I'm interested in the roof. And so you can see they've decided to go with a scissor lift at the back, which means the roof kind of goes up about a foot before it then turns into a wedge. So this is something that we are seriously considering for our roof. And then obviously to have a gas strut on either side. I've had a really good look at the canvas too. I really like how it has a lip at the bottom to keep the rain out. At the top, it's all fully enclosed in some sort of cater rail, but that goes around the corner. And look how sharp and taut that court canvas is. That's exactly what I'm hoping to emulate on ours. And something else that we've been thinking about lately, if I'm gonna do a wedge with the new interior, maybe it makes sense to do a reverse wedge like that. So instead of hinging it at the front and having it open that way, it's hinged essentially at the back and it opens the wrong way around. This gives us a few more interesting layout options to do with the bed and being able to sit downstairs and say maybe read a book or work on my laptop even if the bed was down and Katie was up on the bed reading a book or whatever. So we're toying with that idea, nothing's locked in, but I'm really learning a lot by looking at other solutions and what's been done. That really is the greatest reason to come to these shows. Another really good one to learn from here is all of the solar panels mounted to this rooftop tent. I mean, no, all the rest of it I'm kind of ignoring, but these are obviously lightweight, flexible panels, which is what I'm interested in using. It looks like, though, they've been directly attached to that rooftop tent, uh, and that's steel and it's black. So I'm going to say that they probably get quite hot in the sun, which reduces their efficiency by like 50%. Um, I do like how clean it is and how they've used up so much of the available roof space. I'm going to say those are like 75 watt panels at a guess. So they've got what, like 300 watts up there. That's, that's pretty nice. So that's the kind of thing that I'm learning from and I'm looking at so that I can incorporate those lessons into my build. Definitely seeing more and more electric vehicles show up around the show. And uh, of course Rivian making a pretty strong showing with their pickup truck that is overlanding because it's got a rooftop tent on it. It took me a while, I scratched my head. Of course, they have this hose here from the window up to the rooftop tent because you can just run the heater all night because it's electric and it's only gonna drain your like 120 kilowatt hour battery or whatever it is, and that's gonna heat your rooftop tent. Actually kind of convenient. I mean, I guess it uses up a tiny bit of your range, but it's a little bit like having a diesel heater if it's drinking from your diesel tank. Same idea really, but not bad for the planet, question mark? Who knows? And I'm not gonna lie, the time definitely comes when you just get overloaded. There are just so, so many shiny vehicles to look at. It is impossible to take them all in. By the second day, I just found a quiet corner. I sat on the ground and I played with my laptop, just trying to have some downtime before I came back to continue the tour. This is just a mere fraction of what's on display. And once again, you can see, You've got a monster Jeep sitting next to some old school car on tank tracks, next to a plaid, something like, it just goes on and on. This thing has clear wheels. I have no idea why, other than again, it attracts attention. 
It just is madness of the automotive variety. And you can see why my Jeep is almost invisible compared to these seriously attention-grabbing, quirky, odd, wonderful creations that people bring to SEMA. My friend Brian from Exploring Elements is an automotive journalist and he got a pass for a ride-along in one of these mini trophy truck things. I took a bunch of photos and videos for him and he took my GoPro along for the ride. Pretty fun to go out on the burnout pad, do a whole bunch of donuts and figure eights, just for the fun. As the regular show came to a close on Friday afternoon, Brian and I wandered down to SEMA Ignited, the big festival they have at the end of the show. The Nitro Circus guys are here on motorbikes, there's a Formula Drift demonstration, we've got live music, and of course, the Hoonigan guys brought everything. Again, this is just a crazy celebration of all things automotive. And it really was capped off by the Hoonigan guys doing a simultaneous 43 car burnout for 43 seconds in honor of Ken Block, who passed away earlier this year. When the smoke cleared, there was carnage all around blown tires, blown vehicles, fires to put out, and of course, plenty of rubber on the road. With our media passes, Brian and I jumped the fence and we got pretty close to the Hoonicorn and then the family huckster with Travis Pastrana behind the wheel. I've actually met and hung out with Travis before at a Yokohama event. Although that was a few years ago, I don't expect him to remember who I am, but it was pretty fun. We had a quick chat. I gave him a high five and said, dude, that was awesome. The next morning I was up with the sun and on the road at 6am for another monstrous travel day, unwinding everything to get back to my sleepy little town in Canada. That brings an end to SEMA 2023. Thanks very much for watching, thanks to my Patreon supporters who make all of this possible, and I hope you enjoyed the madness as much as I did. Will I be back? Let's wait and see. Maybe next time I should try to get my vehicle inside the show. I think then it will get the attention it deserves.